Hi everyone. In this lecture, you're going to learn about host microbe interaction. So I'm going to talk about both beneficial host microbe interactions and ones that cause disease. So when I mention host microbe interactions, I'm referring to you or if we're animals as a host, and then microbes are any microorganisms, so bacteria, viruses, that's what we're going to focus on here. What happens when you have this relationship, this interaction? So that could refer to your normal normal flora, the normal bacteria on you, how does that affect you? And then an infectious disease when a host is infected with a pathogenic microbe. So we're going to focus on kind of two opposite things, but they both refer to host microbe interactions. So the beneficial host microbe interactions and then the pathogenic ones. And in this lecture, we're going to begin by talking about about the normal microbiota, your flora, which are interchangeable terms, infectious disease terms I want everyone to know, and then how a microbe actually becomes or is pathogenic. Like why do we have some, some bacteria that are pathogenic and some that are not? So that's where mechanisms of pathogenicity hit in this part of the lecture. Okay, to start off with some background, microbes are everywhere. So you guys know this, we talked about it in the beginning of class, and we see microbes all the time. Um, if all microbes were bad, we would be sick all the time and most of us, we wouldn't even have a population of people. So you're breathing microbes, you're eating microbes, you're touching microbes all the time. Most microbes don't harm us. Some just colonize body surfaces, other are come and go with your different epithelial skin cells. And most swallowed microbes, you swallow microbes all the time. They die in your stomach acid, they're eliminated in feces, your immune system targets them. So there's relatively few pathogens overall when we think about the number of microbes that cause disease. A lot of times people focus on pathogens because when we're learning about medicine and um, nursing school and all these schools, that's your focus because you're treating patients. But just know that there's a wide array of microbes that are harmless and many are even beneficial. So just finally to talk about the pathogenic microbes, some microbes can cause disease if there's an opportunity. We're gonna go back and talk about that. So opportunistic pathogens are pathogens that are otherwise harmless, but if a person is immunocompromised, they may make them sick. So immunocompromised meal means that someone has any disease or disorder or illness or anything that has compromised their immune system. So for example, patients with cancer get opportunistic infections more than a healthy patient. Patients who have had surgery, patients who've had burns, and we'll get back to this point. But the take home message from this slide that I want everyone to take is, microbes are everywhere. You're seeing and you're getting infected with microbes all the time. Most are just not doing anything for us. So another thing I want everyone to know is in this relationship of host and microbe, and we're going to use humans as a host now, um, there are different relationships between the host and the microbe. They can be beneficial, they can be harmful, they can be neutral. We call these different relationships symbiosis. So symbiosis means living together, and a host and a microbe living together can lead to three different relationships. Some relationships. Some relationships between the host and the microbe are neutral, are neutral, so we call that commensalism. That means that one organism is unaffected at all while the other benefits. So we have a lot of microbes that live on our skin. They don't do anything for us. We're not harmed by them. We're not helped by them. They're just neutral, but they benefit from us from eating your dead skin cells and they have an environment to live. So that's commensalism. So in the commensalism, we're not affected. That's the neutral part, but one organism benefits. In mutualism, both organisms benefit. So both the host and the microbe benefit. An example of this is we have a lot of bacteria in our large intestine as part of your normal flora. So some, some like E. coli species make different vitamins for us, which are important in digestion. And so that's how we benefit. We get the vitamins that the bacteria make for us. And then the bacteria benefit because they have a place to live that's full of nutrients, that um, has everything they need in terms of temperature, 
temperature, oxygen, all the different things we, realize, we learned about that help bacteria grow. Finally, the last relationship or symbiosis is parasitism. That's when one organism benefits, but another is harmed. So in a host microbe interaction, maybe the microbe is the parasite and you're the host that's being harmed. So the microbe is benefiting by living on you and you're the one who's getting harmed. So that's parasitism and all pathogens are parasites. So keep that in mind. So again, with commensalism, one organism is not affected at all, one benefits. When both organisms benefit, that's mutualism. And parasitism is when one organism is harmed while the other one benefits. Okay, we're gonna focus now, we're gonna focus the first half of this lecture on talking about the human microbiota and flora. So just the microbes that normally colonize your body. And then the second half of the lecture, we're gonna talk about pathogenic microbes. So your normal flora or microbiota or microbiome, all these terms basically mean the same thing, are the microbes that normally colonize your body surfaces. And most of them are beneficial, a lot of them are neutral. Um, and I think we've classified a lot of them as neutral because we just don't know what they do for us. And there's a lot of studies being done on this all the time, discovering the, um, the function of microbiome and things we didn't know it does. So our microbiome is very important to the human health. But just keep in mind that even though most of them are beneficial, some normal microbiota are opportunistic pathogens, which meaning they can become pathogens if we become immunocompromised. They're not pathogens, so they're fine, they're living on you, everything is good. But if you become immunocompromised, maybe that's when they become a pathogen. And we'll talk about that. So we see our normal microbiota in different locations in our body. To sum up, you see microbes all over your body. Anywhere you can think of, you see microbes. So we see microbes in your skin and various mucous membranes, your eyes, the upper respiratory system. When I say upper respiratory system, I'm talking about the nose and throat. We do not see microbes in the lower respiratory system. That's your lungs. Your lungs should be sterile. If you have microbes in there, they can cause something very bad. Mouth has a ton of microbes. We talked about this with the oral microbiota lab. The large intestine has the most amount of microbes in your body, the most amount of bacteria. And I, actually, it's not just bacteria. So you see other organisms, like for example, yeast are part of our microbiota, but most of it is bacteria. And the reason why we see most organisms uh, from our microbiota in the large intestine is because it's, first of all, it's large and there's a lot of moisture and nutrients there. So organisms are very happy. We also see microbes in our urinary system and reproductive systems. So you can see in this image, like nose har harbors staphylococcus species, cornybacterium species, the throat has streptococcus, Neisseria, mycoplasma. So different organisms we see everywhere in our body. So this is a normal microbiota. And it differs from person to person. We're gonna talk about that. So the composition of your microbiota begins at birth and it will be different whether you were born naturally, so through a vaginal birth or through a C-section. We uh, Scientists have noticed that when you look at babies, um, when you do a microbiome, so you look at all the microbes in babies born vaginally and babies born through C-section, we see a different composition of bacteria found in them. Breastfeeding also affects the composition of the microbiome. And actually, to talk about breastfeeding really quickly, so from reading this research article where I got this image of, what breastfeeding does is it doesn't let your microbiome mature as fast. When I say mature, when we look at a baby's bacteria, a baby's microbiome, it's, it looks different than an adult's microbiome, which it should look different because of the different things that they're dealing with and the different things they've been exposed to. When a baby's, according to this research article, when a baby's breastfed longer, their microbiome stays true to being a baby, whereas babies who stop being breastfed or are not being able to be breastfed for various reasons, their microbiome over time looks more adult-like.
Another thing that your microbiome could affect is it could affect your body weight, it could affect your mood, it could affect a lot of things. So the, I, what I want you to take from these two slides is that the composition of your microbiota really determines a lot about our health and also changes with your physiological state, meaning your mood, whether you're stressed, whether you're depressed, whether you're happy, whether you're excited. So when they've, I keep wanting to say sequenced, but when you look at the microbiome, microbiome of people who have different emotional disorders and you could see that the microbiome for example in depressed and anxious individuals looks very different from those who are not you could look at certain bacteria that we see more commonly in depressed individuals. It also changes with your lifestyle, whether like your diet, whether you smoke, all of these things. So we play a huge role in the composition of our microbiota, which changes throughout our life based genetically and on decisions that we make. So example, this is a very popular example. If we look at microbiota from an obese individual versus from an lean individual, as this article did, we see different bacteria. So what this article wanted to do is they wanted to see, well, if we take this bacteria now from an obese individual and a lean individual, which is how they termed these individuals, and we put them in mice that are the same. So you have a mouth, a mouse that starts off the same, and you put bacteria from an obese individual and bacteria from a lean individual what will happen to the mouse and you feed them the same exact diet what they noticed is the mouse that has a microbiota transplant from an obese individual had more fat tissue than the mouse that got microbiome from the lean individual so we know that microbiota plays a role in your weight Another thing is that it changes among people and over time. So if you look at yourself through the years and within a year, you see different microbiota. So just the, what I want you guys to get from these slides is the bacteria in us really plays a big role in our health overall, whether that's our body weight, our mood. Mood is a big one that they've been studying for a very long time. Um, the How we metabolize different food, all of these things. And the reason why this is becoming important in research moving forward is researchers are thinking, okay, can we, for example, look at a healthy individual, whether we're talking about mood or body weight or anything, and study what bacteria are specifically found like in higher composition than in individuals who are not as healthy? And can we market that or manufacture that as a medication to give people to help them? So the microbiome, as you've seen in the previous slides, it, can, it has a lot of beneficial roles for us. So that one of the main roles is it protects us from harmful organisms. The way it does that is the bacteria that we have, the good bacteria, compete for nutrients by pathogens. So by harmful organisms, I mean pathogens. So if you have a lot of good bacteria and pathogens come, there's no nutrients for them. So therefore they won't grow. The good bacteria also covers binding sites so that pathogens have nowhere to stick. They don't have an environment to go in. But your good microbiota provides antimicrobial substances that will kill potential pathogens. They alter the pH and oxygen conditions so that harmful organisms, pathogens cannot grow. And another thing that our human microbiota plays for us is that it can stimulate our adaptive immune system. This is a big area of research right now is how is your microbiome affecting your immune system? What we've seen is that your body makes antibodies against your normal microbiota and these antibodies can be used to bind to potential pathogens, which is a good thing. A study was also done that showed that mice in microbe-free environments, so they're not exposed to a lot of bacteria, had under developed malt, which is mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. And just to really quickly simplify what this is, it means that you don't have a very good lymphatic system. And lymphatic system has a lot of really good white blood cells that protect you against pathogens. Your microbiome also is important in the development of oral tolerance. Oral tolerance, I mean, I mean like food and allergies. So the immune system lessens its response to many microbes in the gut as well as food. So the more food you're exposed to at a young age because of your microbiota, 
hopefully the less allergic you will be to, to different foods. So this is the idea of a hygiene hypothesis, which says that insufficient exposure to microbes leads to allergies, meaning that you really should get exposed to a lot of microbes because this is how you build your immune system. And our microbiome is playing a role in this. And then our microbiome also aids in digestion of food. So all the bacteria on your large intestine, remember this is where we see the most microbiome. They really help with breaking down food, increasing nutrient uptake. This is the whole idea in maybe uh, individuals who are leaner have bacteria that help them break down food more efficiently. And then they produce important substances for us, such as various vitamins, not just vitamin K. So again, the human microbiome protects you against harmful organisms, can stimulate your adaptive immune system, can help you develop oral tolerance to food to not build allergies, can aid di in digestion, can produce vitamins. So it's very beneficial. One other thing I would add here that your book doesn't talk about because it's relatively new is that it can help you with different um, moods. Like it, this is what we were talking about with like depression versus stress. So people who are, are, who we look at who are depressed and stressed have a very different composition of their microbiota than those who are not. And so this is all what they do for us. What do we do for them? If we were in class, I would ask you guys, what we do for these organisms is we provide them an environment and nutrients. So we give them a place to live and we give them nutrients and we also protect them. So you're protecting when they get to grow in your large intestine, they're protected against a lot of stressful environmental factors. Antibiotics can affect your human microbiota. This, as years have gone by, we're learning, we've talked a lot, a lot about it in class, that antibiotics are not the best thing to give someone for every single infection. So they're great, but when we overuse antibiotics, we can suppress someone's microbiota. So we want to be careful with that because you're killing all the good bacteria. So some antibiotics inhibit lactobacillus. As an example, lactobacillus is bacteria found in the vagina of mature females. And when you have, when you have a female taking high amounts of antibiotics and it's killing their normal microbiota, specifically lactobacillus, candida, which is a type of yeast that we have in our normal flora, will overgrow and this can result in a yeast infection. Also, oral antibiotics can result in the overgrowth of C. diff, which we're going to learn about later in the class. Clostridium difficile is a bacteria that can cause really bad digestive disorders. So it, it is part of our normal microbiota, but in very, very small amounts. When you take antibiotics that kill off the good bacteria, we allow this organism to grow. So this is what could happen if you take a broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, the last lecture of the lecture before I forgot was about antibiotics. Remember with broad spectrum antibiotics, they're broad, so they target a broad range of bacteria. Well, not only will they target the pathogen, they'll also target the other good microbes in you. So that's why they can really affect the composition of this and harm you in the long run. And I read a study that came out recently that was saying that it, people who take antibiotics in the long run, what they've seen is that they potentially develop more severe autoimmune inflammatory and allergic diseases because their microbiome is so affected by high amounts of antibiotics. And then finally, I want to talk about the normal microbiota, that it can be harmful in certain situations. So we talked about all the great things and how it protects you, but in like unique situations, it can be harmful. The two unique situations I want to talk about is when we have an imbalance or overgrowth of your normal flora. So imbalance, which is called dysbiosis, means that your microbiome is not balanced out. Like you don't have this amount of this bacteria and this bacteria and that. You have one bacteria maybe that's more dominating than another. So imbalance dysbiosis can lead to digestion problems, can lead to obesity, 
can lead to a lot of things. Super infection, when you have overgrowth of normal microbes, this can also cause disease. So we want to we want to make sure that the your normal microbiota is at the amount it should be. There's no overgrowth and there's no imbalance of one microbe over other microbes. So when we have dysbiosis and overgrowth, this can lead to different diseases. And this can be caused by taking broad spectrum antibiotics. So keep that in mind, your normal flora protects you, but if your normal flora is affected, you can have overgrowth of other components of your normal flora that should only be present in small amounts. Also, if your normal flora change their usual anatomical site, this can lead to disease. So for example, Staphylococcus, bacteria staphylococcus epidermis from the name is found on your skin it should be on your skin it shouldn't go anywhere else it can cause disease when it gets out of its usual location which is skin so an example of this is staphylococcus getting into blood or deeper tissue um i had this i think i told you guys with my baby daughter so when she she had a staphylococcus infection because she kept itching and itching and itching because of eczema and she has staphylococcus on her skin so it got to her it got deeper and she had to take antibiotics because even though staphylococcus is good on her skin, it shouldn't get into the blood and into deeper tissue. And finally, two terms I want to mention is that you get your normal flora either through your resident flora or your transient flora. Resident flora are microbes that permanently colonize the host, so they're always there, and they don't cause disease under normal conditions. Transient flora are microbes that we pick up temporarily that can be present for days, weeks, or months. So maybe you've contacted something in the environment by touching a door, that's your transient bacteria. Resident bacteria is a bacteria that's usually always there, and your normal flora consists of these two. So for all of us, if you were to seek our microbiome or discover it, you would get your resident flora and your transient flora. Now you can't tell the difference, but that's what it consists of. And the composition of your normal flora, again, it changes its dynamic over your life. It's different if you're a male or a female. It's different if you're 20 years old or 70 years old or two years old. So it changes with your lifestyle and you do have an effect on it. The Human Microbiome Project is an important project that was done years ago to analyze the relationship between our microbiome and our human health. And what they wanted to see is they wanted to see, can we look at healthy individuals and those that have various diseases? Maybe we can look at specific cancers and see, is the microbiota affected? And this is helpful because maybe with treatment and prevention options, like if we know that cancer, certain cancers are caused by some microflora getting affected more than others, maybe we can alter the bacteria and disease in, in different disease state patients, such as cancer patients. Okay, so we covered the normal microbiota. Now I'm gonna talk about principles of infectious disease. So infectious disease from the name are thing, microbes that are bad. So we were basically talking about good host microbe interactions. Now we're gonna talk about disease. What happens when we have bad host microbe interactions where the microbe is the bad one? This is an example of parasitism here. When one organism is and one organism is harmed and the other one is benefiting. So we're gonna, I'm gonna give you guys some terms that I want you to know, especially as microbiology students carrying on with your life. Some of these were terms we've already mentioned in class. So a pathogen is something that causes disease. So if I tell you this microbe is a pathogen, it means it causes disease. Host is the organism that's affected by the pathogen. Pathogenicity is the ability to cause a disease. So if I tell you, is this specific bacterium pathogenic? I'm asking you, does it cause disease? We use these terms a lot as microbiologists. Virulence is how much it causes disease. It's the degree of pathogenicity. So if I tell you um, this organism is more virulent than this organism, it means it causes more disease. For example, the influenza virus is way more, um, sorry, the influenza virus is way less virulent than the HIV virus. Um, coronavirus 
right now what we have SARS-CoV-2 is more virulent than a lot of coronavirus strains we've seen in the past. So keep that in mind. So this is what I'm referring to with this term, virulence. The more virulent something is, the more pathogenic it is, the more it causes a disease. And the way a microbe is virulent is because it has virulence factors. These are different components that allow a microbe to cause disease. Without the virulence factors, the microbe can't cause disease. Examples, so not all bacteria are pathogenic. The bacteria that are pathogenic have virulence factors. So examples of virulence factors is flagella. So if you're a bacterium and you have flagella, you can move. This helps you cause disease. If you're a bacteria and you produce a toxin that makes someone have bad diarrhea, this is a virulence factor. If you have adhesions that help you stick on your host, this is a virulence factor. Meaning that if I was investigating this bacteria that caused bad disease and I went and I stopped all these virulence factors, I didn't kill the bacteria. I just stopped its ability to move. I stopped its ability to stick to other cells, I stopped its ability to make toxins, it might not be pathogenic anymore. So scientists try to investigate different virulence factors of different bugs or microbes. Viruses, I'm focusing on viruses in this lecture with everything going on. Viruses also have virulence factors. So one virulence factor of viruses is spikes. Without the spikes, a lot of times the viruses will not be as efficient in causing infection. Also, maybe they have certain enzymes that make them more virulent. Um, reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that we see in HIV. We don't see it in all viruses. That's why a lot of viruses are not that harmful and you get them and your immune system fights them. So that's an example of a virulence factor. So virulence factors are anything that the bug has that will make it cause more disease. Okay, more terms. Pathology is the study of disease. Etiology is the cause of disease. So the cause of COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2. So etiology, again, is the cause of disease. Predisposing factor or risk factor, they mean the same thing as anything that makes your body more susceptible to getting a disease. So we talked about uh, UTIs last time with our lab. One risk factor or a predisposing factor to being more prone to UTIs is being a female. So female anatomy makes you more at risk of getting UTIs than male anatomy. Or you know, a good one is we're doing all the coronavirus stuff. People with heart conditions are more at risk of getting severe COVID-19 infections than those that are not. So having heart conditions, having diabetes, having asthma puts you at a predisposing risk factor. Infection, the definition of an infection is that the body has been colonized by the pathogen. So in science, when I say, did the mice get infected? I mean, were the microbes able to replicate in the body of the mice or the bacteria? Were they able to make copies of themselves? Disease is any abnormal state where the body is not performing normal function. So anytime something's affected, your lungs are affected, your intestines are affected, your skin's affected, that's a state of disease. In more terms, primary infection is the initial infection that develops in a healthy person. So right now, if I go out and I get a cold, not coronavirus, just a regular cold, um, I, that would be my primary infection. Now let's say I get this cold and then after getting this cold, I get a UTI. That could be a secondary infection. A secondary infection is any, another infection that develops in someone who's already had a primary infection. So this is an opportunistic infection and we see a secondary infections all the time in hospitals. A patient comes in, they came in for some primary infection and all of a sudden in the hospital they have three other infections. UTIs are very common secondary infections. So yeast infections are common secondary infections. The primary infections predispose you to secondary infections because they make you more immunocompromised. Your immune system is dealing with something already so it's not at its full capacity to fight disease. 
And finally, opportunistic infections. So opportunistic infections are diseases of opportunity. They're infections that are caused by pathogens that take advantage of that your immune system is not functioning to its strongest capacity, meaning that you have some weakened immune system. This can be due to many things. So maybe your microbiota is altered because you've been taking a lot of antibiotics. So now you get a yeast infection. That's an opportunistic infection. Um, maybe you're you're taking chemotherapy and your that alters your immune system your immune system's already dealing with a lot so now you can easily get a pseudomonas infection a staphylococcus infection so organisms that wouldn't otherwise really be that harmful now can be very harmful there is different causes of opportunistic infection so anything that affects your immune system makes you more prone to opportunistic infections. So if you're pregnant, your energy is going towards making a baby and sustaining a baby. So you're a lot more prone to opportunistic infections. P uh, patients with bone marrow disease, bone marrow transplants, people with HIV, people with different genetic predisposition, different genetic disorders, Crohn's disease, all these th things that affect their immune system now can get sicker easily. So those are called opportunistic infections. And clinical and subclinical infections are also terms I want you to know. A clinical infection is an infection that shows signs and symptoms. These are much better than subclinical infections. In turn, when I say better, it's because when some signs and symptoms are a great thing. Signs and symptoms get people to go to the doctor and deal with whatever it is they're infected with. There are a lot of infections that are subclinical. Subclinical is the exact opposite. It means that you're infected, but you show no signs or symptoms. So you're infected, you have something, but you do not know. I want to differentiate symptoms and signs. Signs is something that you can see, so it's an, it's objective. You can if a patient if you are a doctor and a patient comes to you, you can see signs. Maybe you can see yellow in their eyes. You can see a rash. You can see swelling. You can see you can actually see the person with what show, is showing. Symptoms are subjective. Symptoms is what you ask the patient, and they tell you, "I have a headache." You cannot see a headache. I have pain. I have nausea. So clinical infections so show signs and symptoms. Symptoms. Subclinical infections have no signs and symptoms, but you're still infected with the bacteria or the virus or whatever microbe. And you are still contagious in a lot of times when you have a subclinical infection. So I wanted to put this image here for you guys. With SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, COVID-19 is caused by both patients with clinical infections and those with subclinical infections. So Clinical infection patients with COVID-19, here, let me go back, they show the symptoms that you all have heard of in the news that are common of coronavirus. They have a fever, they have dry coughs, they have pain, they have a sore throat. But there are a lot of people who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and they show no symptoms. So these are subclinical infections and these are the people we worry about and this is why we're doing the quarantine. So again, many people, have clinical infections, but a lot of us have infections that we're not aware of because there's no signs or symptoms. Then we're gonna talk about localized and systemic infections. Local infections are infections that are limited to a small area of your body. So maybe you have like a little bit of eczema on your face or, or your hands, that's a local infection. Systemic or generalized infection is an infection that spreads throughout your body. Um, Another example of a local infection is you have like a kidney infection. That's a local infection that's limited to your kidneys, but it can quickly become a systemic or generalized infection if the bacteria move into your blood. So systemic infections are generally much worse than local infections because they're, they've spread and it's harder for your immune system to target them. Bloodborne infections or infections in the blood are an example of systemic infections. Anything that ends with emia is in the blood. So bacteremia is bacteria in the blood. Toxemia is toxins in the blood. Viremia is viruses in the blood. So you guys get it? And when we have uh, any of these organisms in the blood, they can lead to sepsis. Sepsis is the spread of microbes from their point of infection. So they spread everywhere. A lot of times people think sepsis as microbes in the blood. 
it, the definition of it is the microbes have spread. So that's sepsis. And it's a very toxic condition that can lead to septic shock. Septic shock is life-threatening low blood pressure, and it can occur from sepsis. So sepsis and septic shock are very serious conditions that people in hospitals deal with all the time. A lot of times people start off with a very small local infection that quickly progresses because their body can't fight it into a systemic infection. Now we're moving on to a different topic and we're gonna talk about something called mechanisms of pathogenicity, pathogenicity. So for an organism to be pathogenic or cause the disease, it needs to do different things. So there's different mechanisms for how it can cause disease. So a successful pathogen is one that establishes an infection or a disease, and it establishes an infection by replicating or colonizing your body. To be able to do that, it needs to evade your immune system, it needs to harm your tissue, it needs to do different things. And keep in mind, pathogens don't benefit by killing the host. They don't want to kill you because then they lose their nutrients and they lose their ability to be transmitted more. So it's an interesting thing that scientists think about all the time. Why do some viruses and bacteria kill the host if it doesn't benefit them? So just something for you guys to think about. So to establish an infection in a host, a pathogen has to do a lot of things. That's why most pathogen, most um, microbes are not pathogens. It takes a lot of work to be a pathogen. For a pathogen to establish an infection, it needs to adhere, it needs to stick to you. Well, okay, actually, let me, let me back up. So first it needs to enter you. And now once it's entered, it needs to stick to your cells somehow. It needs to get in your cells. Then it needs to be able to make copies of itself, which is colonization or invading. Then once it makes copies of itself, to be able to establish a really good infection if you're a pathogen, you need to avoid or overcome the host immune system. And you also damage the host. So those are the mechanisms of pathogenicity. Is can, Do you do all of these things as a microbe? The first one is getting in then adhering, then after you adhere, colonizing the host cells, then after colonizing the host cells, making sure that you're somehow avoiding the host defenses like fever and inflammation and white blood cells and phagocytosis, and then damaging the host. So we're gonna talk further about all of these points. And every year when we do this mechanisms of pathogenicity, I choose whatever disease is very common at the time that we're learning about this so we can focus on that. So right now, as all of you guys know, COVID-19 is, uh, is causing a pandemic in the world. So we're gonna use a virus to study mechanisms of pathogenicity. I like to usually use bacteria to study this, but we're gonna talk about the virus. So just to recap, COVID-19 is the novel coronavirus that's caused by SARS-CoV-2, the virus, which is a world pandemic. As of this morning, so when I checked, it's May 2020, there's over 3.5 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 disease and over 200,000 deaths worldwide. The outbreak began in China at the end of 2019. And when this outbreak began, we saw severe respiratory infections. As a reminder, coronaviruses are a large family of viruses, but SARS-CoV-2 is one member of the family of viruses. It's very new. We're still learning a lot about the virus. This is why we don't have a vaccine yet. We don't have drugs out. So there's still a lot of studies being done. And we're going to focus on, well, why is this virus pathogenic? Why is it actually very virulent compared to other coronaviruses? Remember, virulent means it's worse. It's, uh, it causes more disease. So we're going to go through the steps of pathogenicity. So one of the first things for a microbe to be a pathogen, it has to enter the host. If it doesn't enter the host, it can't make you sick. There's different portals of entry for microbes. Microbes can enter through your skin. They can enter through mucous members, membranes. So this is conjunctivo, eyes, respiratory tract openings, gastrointestinal tract openings, urogenital openings. So all of these things are ways that uh, organisms, microbes can get in. They can enter cross, they can cross the placenta and affect the fetus. They can enter through bites, injections, wounds, which we call parenteral routes. And these are basically um, maybe like a contaminated injection or a mosquito bite. 
And I want everyone to know that almost all pathogens have a preferred portal of entry. So if I ask everyone right now, if we think of the HIV virus as a pathogen, does it enter through the digestive tract, gastrointestinal tract, meaning if I took food and I put some HIV virus on it, will you get it? And the answer is no, that's not its preferred portal of entry. So every organism has a preferred portal of entry. Some uh, go through urogenital openings. With the SARS-CoV-2 virus, its preferred portal of entry is through the mouth, nose, or eyes. So you get it, you can get it through your eyes, you can get it through your nose, you can get it through your mouth. That's why they're telling people, wash your hands and don't touch your face. This is how this virus enters. It's not, for example, entering through urogenital openings, as we know, like you cannot get it from urine or sex. You cannot get the virus. E. coli O103 bacteria causes bad diarrhea. I wanted to use this as an example. This bacteria enters you through you ingesting contaminated food. So this virus enters you, enters through respiration, respiring contaminated droplets. E. coli bacteria enters through you eating contaminated food. So again, the take home message from this is every microbe has a preferred portal of entry. After a microbe enters, because many microbes are entering you all the time, to cause disease, it has to adhere or stick to your cells. If it doesn't, it's not going to cause disease. This is why we're not sick all the time. Yes, a lot of microbes are getting in, whether through your nose, through your skin, through your eyes, through anything, and they need to adhere. That's the next step in mechanisms of pathogenicity. So pathogens will attach to your cells through your cell receptors. So our cells have our cells have receptors and pathogens have adhesions that they use to stick to your cell receptors. So again, the pathogens have their adhesions. Their adhesions can be pili, capsules that we see on bacteria, they can be spikes on viruses, and they use whatever adhesion it is to stick to your cells. Your cells have receptors. So with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it uses its spikes. Its spikes are its adhesions to stick to your cells. And it specifically uses the ACE2 receptor that's found on various cells. One of the most common cell types that it's found on this receptor is our respiratory cells. So we see the ACE2 receptor on our upper respiratory cells, so nose and throat, and lower respiratory cells. So there's a lot of this receptor, and this virus uses its spikes, which are its adhesions, to stick to your ACE2 receptors. If it didn't have spikes, it probably wouldn't be able to stick. So we have to keep that in mind. This is what makes it pathogenic. E. coli, on the other hand, the one that causes bad diarrhea, will use its adhesions to stick on intestinal epithelial cells and release toxin that causes diarrhea. So again, in this step, we're saying that microbes in order to be pathogenic, they need to adhere and they use their adhesions. For SARS-CoV-2, it has spikes that it uses and those spikes adhere to the ACE2 receptor found on various cells. So you see the ACE2 receptor on heart cells, lung cells, kidney cells, other cells, but for some reason, the last research article was saying we don't know why the virus is not attaching to heart cells, which is a good thing, but we still don't know enough about it. Okay, after the microbe adheres, it needs to make copies of itself. That's what colonization means. So colonization means that the pathogen needs to replicate, reproduce, make copies of itself. It, and if it doesn't, okay, think about it this way. One virus or one bacteria and think how big you are. It's not going to harm you. In order to harm you, it needs to make a lot of copies of itself. So some microbes are more virulent than others. They, you only need a small amount, but still, you always need more than one. So if they cannot make more copies of themselves, they cannot be pathogenic. SARS-CoV-2 is able to efficiently replicate in our respiratory tract cells. So these are nose cells, throat cells, lung cells. E. coli colonizes or makes copies of itself in intestinal cells. If they, if both the virus 
and the bacteria did not make, colonize or make copies of themselves, you would have no infection. So this is another mechanism of pathogenicity. And if we're focusing on SARS-CoV-2, so 80% of around 80% of cases are mild to moderate cold cases with people who have SARS-CoV-2. It's 20% that are severe cases. And so the reason why 80% are mild to moderate is that the virus, it's for many reasons, but it'll replicate in the nose and throat, but it won't have a chance to get to the lungs. So your body will have fought it off before it can colonize the lungs. The reason why we have 20% severe rate is because in 20% of people, give or take, so this is the estimate we have or not, we have now, the virus is going all the way down and colonizing the lungs. And this is the problem with this virus is that it can colonize lung cells. So keep that in mind that the, and the mechanism of pathogenicity is that the microbes have to colonize. Okay, so they've entered, they've adhered, they've colonized. Now to make someone sick, you still have to evade host immune responses because if you do all of these things and the immune system is able to eat you up, kill you through inflammation or fever, then you're not an efficient pathogen. So pathogens also have to avoid host defenses and they can avoid phagocytosis by many different ways. So a lot of microbes, unfortunately for us, have come up with very elaborate ways to avoid being phagocytosed by our white blood cells. So some bacteria have capsules, some have mycolic acid, and by having these things, it's hard for your white blood cells to recognize them. Some pathogens destroy your white blood cells by producing toxins. And and some pathogens, which I think this is kind of the coolest one, not for us, but for the pathogens, have come up with ways to be able to survive within a phagocyte. So once they've been taken in by a phagocyte, they form a phago in the phagosome, they can survive efficiently. They're not affected, so they form kind of a vesicle around themselves, so they're not affected by the, their, the digestive enzymes. Some pathogens avoid antibodies so they can hide in your cells. They can change their antigens. Remember, antibodies are specific to the antigen. So if your body forms an antibody for one antigen and then it changes, it mutates, then the body cannot fight it off anymore. This is our problem with viruses. Viruses mutate a lot in general. So it's hard for, for some viruses, it's hard for your body to fight them off. They can mimic host antigens where your body's not forming antibodies against them. They can destroy antibodies. There's many, many different mechanisms for how different microbes will avoid host defenses. With SARS-CoV-2, again, it's still a new virus, a new area of research. The last I read, the reason why it's able to efficiently cause disease is that it mutates rapidly. It has one of the largest RNA genomes. And this is not a good thing because when you have such a large RNA genome, you can make mistakes a lot when you copy yourself. So when the virus goes and makes copies of itself and its genome is so huge, it can easily um, change a C for an A and do all of these changes, which will make it mutate. And now your body cannot form antibodies against it. Another thing is if the virus mutates enough, maybe it can start invading new cell types with new receptors, not just ACE2 cell receptors. And the virus also potentially has accessory proteins that can block interferons. Interferons, if any of you guys remembered in the immune system, they were important proteins that stop viruses from replicating. So they're important proteins that our bodies make as part of our immune system. Okay, after you've done all these great things as a pathogen, so you've entered the host, you've adhered to the host cells, you've colonized the host, meaning you've made copies of yourself, you've avoided host cell defenses, now you're going to damage the host. So you're gonna, damaging host means you're gonna disrupt some cell function. Some pathogens use up the host cell nutrients. They take up your, your iron, they take up different components, making you anemic, making you weak. They can physically lyse host cells. So we see this a lot in um, throat viruses. So strep throat, remember when we talked about beta gemo, uh, 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 beta hemolysis. So those bacteria cause lysis of red blood cells in your throat. They can induce immune responses towards the self. So this is very common. What the pathogen will do is 
it infects you. And when all of us have an infection, most for most healthy people, your immune system turns on and it starts fighting the infection. Well, what happens is now your immune system turns on so much that the inflammation not only damages the microbe, but starts damaging our own tissue. And this is a big problem we have with a lot of disease states is it's not really the bacteria that harmed you, it's your immune response trying so hard to fight it that it's damaging your own cells. And intoxications, some pathogens produce toxins and the toxins will destroy the cells, alter the cell function. This is the most common mechanism of pathogenicity in bacteria. So bacteria produce, different bacteria produce toxins and I'll talk about it in a second. So with damaging hosts, with SARS-CoV-2, again, we are still learning about it, it induces inflammation and a lot of other destructive immune responses. And these happen in the respiratory airways, potentially getting to the lungs and all the inflammation in the lungs. Remember, a side effect of inflammation is swelling and fluid uptake. Well, this is not good to happen in the lungs. So the lungs fill with mucus and fluid because the lungs are trying to fight off the infection. But then this becomes bad for people infected because then they can't breathe. So if SARS-CoV-2 is, okay, for most people, for 80% of people, your immune system has fought it. That's why they recovered. But for people where the virus has been able to get to their lower respiratory tract, so they've replicated in the nose, then the throat, then got into the lungs efficiently as the virus, and they've colonized there, your body will start doing a lot of inflammation in the lungs. And this is where we worry about people because so much inflammation can make it hard to breathe. And this can lead to death. And with the E. coli, the O103, the one that I was talking about, it produces toxins and these toxins lyse intestinal cells that cause diarrhea. So they can also lead to kidney damage when they're in your blood. So keep that in mind. So now to sum up all the mechanisms of pathogenicity, you, the microbe has to get in, so there's portals of entry. It has to adhere, it has to colonize, it has to avoid host cell defenses, and it has to damage the host. So these are mechanisms of pathogenicity. And what scientists do is they study these different mechanisms to see if they can stop disease at different stages. And finally, now I'm just gonna talk about toxins to focus on them. So most bacteria, damage the host by producing toxins. Toxins are proteins and these toxins can be endotoxins or exotoxins. They destroy our cells, our host cells by altering cell functioning. They can alter the cell function, they can kill your cells, they can do either one. Exotoxins are toxins that bacteria make that are released. So they're proteins that are released by pathogenic bacteria. Endotoxins are toxins that are made inside, endo, in, in the bacteria, and they're only released when the bacteria die, when they lice. So exotoxins are, they keep being released by the bacteria. Endotoxins are made by the bacteria inside. And we're going to talk about exotoxins as an example right now. So they're proteins made by bacteria and they're secreted by the bacteria into the body or secreted onto and ingested with food. So a lot of food, this is why we worry about canned food. Canned food can have toxins in it and toxins are very potent. They're not like bacteria where you typically need a high amount to get infected. You need very little toxin to be very sick and they can cause local or very systemic effects, meaning they can affect the whole body. They can damage before your immune system even has a time to respond. So toxins are so potent that they start damaging your cells before your immune system has time to understand how to even recognize and target this pathogen. So the way that we deal with toxins is through vaccination. Toxoids are inactivated exotoxins so that your body is ready if it ever does encounter that toxin in the future. There is also antitoxins post-exposure. So if someone's been exposed to toxins, you can inject them with antibodies against specific exotoxins to buy them some time. And the two examples of exotoxins we're gonna talk about are caused by two different bacterial species. 
Botulism, if you guys have heard of the disease, is caused by Clostridium botulinium, and it's an exotoxin that's produced by these bacteria. The bacteria themselves are not bad, it's the exotoxin that they produce that produces botulism. This is a very bad neurotoxin, and what it does is it prevents transmission of nerve impulses, so you get this flaccid paralysis. And this is also where we get Botox from. So Botox is extracted from these bacteria. So in normal, normal nervous system signaling, you have your different nerve cells, and they are they basically contract by signals that are released from the nervous system. One signal called acetylcholine A induces contraction of your muscle fibers. What this toxin does is it blocks releasing of A, so you stop getting contraction, therefore you get paralysis. So it can be very deadly, botulism. And here's the bacteria that causes it. And again, the Clostridium botulinium causes it by releasing this exotoxin. Another disease, tetanus, which we get vaccinated for, is caused by Clostridium tetani. Clostridium tetani release an exotoxin called um, I'm sorry, an exotoxin that's a neurotoxin. And this neurotoxin stops basically muscle relaxation pathway so that someone is always very tight. So when you think of like locked jaw, and this is a picture of a good example of what tetanus can cause. So it's this very rigid paralysis, the opposite of botulism. And this is tetanus. And again, it's caused by the exotoxin that's released by clostridium. So this is the end of the lecture, and basically from this lecture, I wanted you guys to understand the normal flora, how they can be beneficial to us. When are they harmful to us? Are they har they're harmful to us when we see dysbiosis, when we see overgrowth, when we see that they've gone to incorrect location. Then we talked about resident and transient flora, opportunistic pathogens, and then mechanisms of pathogenicity. Remember, that's getting in adherence, colonization, avoiding host defenses, and then the last one, which is damaging the host. And then we ended the lecture by talking about exotoxins. So it's a lot. I hope you guys take time studying this because I think it's very informative for your lives overall.